person right beside you. Would you pray for that person today to just receive the miracle that they need? And would you pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, right now, we thank you, Lord, that miracles are about to take place in this house. Not one person will leave here like they came today, God. God, because today you're going to save, you're going to heal, you're going to deliver, you're going to set free. Not one person leaves with a sickness or disease in their body. God, because right now, right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak miracles into this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Before you sit down, do what we always do. Shake hands with somebody and say, I sure do love you. Say it just that way. And I sure do love you. Would you give Jesus one more big hand, please? <laughs> praise God, praise God, praise God. Have your Bibles this morning. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms 118, verse number 17. Psalms 118, verse number 17. If you do not have this particular scripture marked in your Bible, I would challenge you today to mark this scripture. Because when nothing else will keep you, God's word will keep you. Somebody say amen. I say, when nothing else will keep you, God's word will keep you. Psalm 118, verse number 17. I shall not die. Oh, somebody hear that. I shall not die. But live. But live and declare the works of the Lord. Somebody say amen. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Now, every time I preach this testimony, I get more excited. You know why? That's one more day I have lived to beat the devil. I mean, one more day I have lived to beat the devil. I love to go to the airport and get my airplane and just take off. Every time I take off, I say, devil, just look at him. I'm taking off one more time. I'm taking off one. I just love to do it. I just love to beat the devil. But I have never preached this testimony. But I don't think back of a number of years ago, my wife and our two children and I were preaching youth camps in New Mexico. And we were having a great time. Hundreds of kids were there and God was blessing. And one night during the service, a missionary came to the service and so I invited him to testify. And he gave probably the greatest testimony that I'd ever heard. He shared about how he was preaching on this large Indian reservation one night. He said, Brother Fowler, hundreds of Indians were there, hundreds of them. And he said, so I was preaching, and all of a sudden he said, Lord, he touched him and said, I want you to have a prayer line. So he said, he began to call those Indians out for prayer. And he said, you're not going to believe it, but hundreds of them, hundreds of them got in that prayer line. He said, so I began to pray, and I pray and pray. He said, all of a sudden, a real little short Indian came up to me, and he said, I stood over him and asked him what he wanted. He said, the fellow told me, so he said, I reached out and touched him. And so all of a sudden, he started running and jumping and dancing and shouting everywhere. He said, I went over and I prayed for many more Indians. And he said, all of a sudden, I looked. And back in that prayer line was that same little Indian, the same one. And he said, I said, now, Lord, I'm getting tired. Lord, I have preached for an hour. I've been praying for about three hours. Lord, how am I ever going to get through if that same one keeps coming back? But he said, and then came right back to the prayer line and said, so I stooped up and asked him what he wanted. He said, look at me and smiled at me and says, I just, I just, I just, I just want him to, to do it again. To do it <laughs> To do it again. And so every time I preach this testimony, I think, Lord, I've seen you save. I've seen you heal. I've seen you fill with the Holy Ghost. I've seen you work all kind of miracles. Lord, just do it again. Lord, just do it. Oh, somebody say, Lord. Say, just do it again. Say, Lord, just do it again. And I'll make you a promise before we leave this house today, he's going to do it again. I said, I said, he's going to do it again. Well, needless to say to you, the worst day of my life was December the 1st, 1986, over 20 years ago. But you know something? That day began like all my days. All my days begin with prayer and devotion. And then I went to my office and had a devotion with my staff. And 
some of the students in our Christian school. And then I made a few calls, and then I received a call stating to me that I needed to fly to Meridian, Mississippi on business for our church and our two Christian schools. Well, nothing wrong with flying to Mississippi. I've flown to Mississippi lots of times. But that day was a terrible day to fly. Thunderstorms all over Florida. Thunderstorms all over Alabama. Thunderstorms all over Mississippi. And I just had to fly through the thunderstorms to get to Meridian. But I'm a very experienced pilot. At that time, I had around 4,000 hours as a pilot. Both the engine rated, instrument rated. And so now I've got over 15,000 hours as a pilot. And both engine rated, instrument rated, jet rated. But all you know, you just go to the airport, you know, you file an instrument flight plan. You check out your plane, you get the plane, you taxi out, and you pray. I have never taken off in a plane without praying first. But you know what? When I drove here to Lakeland today, I thought, my God, a whole lot more praise to be done down here than up there. Are you hearing me? I mean, tell you, those people at I-4, they're crazy. I mean, they But anyway, I had prayer, and I took the active runway, and I took off. Oh, the storm was so bad. In moments, my twin engine plane was being tossed this way and that way and every which way. And I had to first fly to Pensacola, Florida to pick up three businessmen who were going with me to Meridian. Now, so we pilots call it shooting the approach. I mean, you're strictly on instruments. I mean, the weather's so bad you can't see out the windshield. You're strictly on instruments. And hopefully and prayerfully, you'll break out and there'll be a runway there beneath you. So I shot the approach into Meridian, Mississippi. I'll shoot me to Pensacola and landed safely. Then I taxied up to pick up these three businessmen. Two of them had never been flying before, let alone in a thunderstorm. Now they got in that plane, and we tax out, and we pray, and then we take off. I'm going to tell you something, brother. Once we took off, nobody had to tell them boys to pray then. Nobody. I mean, they got serious about that praying stuff. I mean, that storm began to rage like this and that, that plane talk. I mean, I heard them talking in tongues. They got serious about that. They got serious about that praying stuff. And we flew on to... Meridian, Mississippi, and I had to shoot the approach of Meridian. And when I landed safely, those three fellows were so glad. Oh, they were so glad just to be on the ground. We spent all that day in business for our church and our Christian schools and get back to the airport late that afternoon, almost dark, and the storms had gotten worse. I mean, it had gotten worse. And the most dangerous flying you can do is at nighttime in thunderstorm. I mean, it's terrible. It's treacherous. But anyway... Those three businessmen and I, we check the plane out, and uh, they get in the plane. And I tax out, we pray, and we take off. Oh, in the worst storm, that twin engine plane being tossed every which way. Those three fellows, they were hanging on, they were praying. We get back to Pensacola, I shoot the approach, land safely, and you know something? Those three fellows didn't care if they ever flew again. I mean, they were just glad to be on the ground. <laughs> glad. But I went in the terminal, and I called my wife. I said, baby, I'm in Pensacola, Florida, about 25 minutes from home. And uh, uh, she said, well, I'm so glad you're almost home. I got your favorite supper ready, Italian sausage and spaghetti. I mean, I was ready to put that plane in high gear. I wanted to get home. But I go back out there, and I check the plane out carefully. I fill the plane with fuel. I get in the plane, and I taxi out. And then I prayed one more time. Now, if you miss everything I say this morning, don't you miss this. I prayed one more time. And then I took that run away and I took off. And the worst storm I've ever flown in in my life. That night on the way back to Panama City, there was times my twin engine plane was thrown a thousand feet straight up. And a thousand feet straight down. It was terrible. It was terrible. I reached the Panama City airspace. The radar controller began to work me into the traffic. He cleared me for this and approach. The eyeless approach. I've shot countless times like clockwork. But all of a sudden, when I reached the outer marker, something terrible happened. The instruments on my plane go, choo, 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 choo. the instruments go out. I'm going to tell you something. When you're in bad weather and you lose your instruments, you're not just in bad weather, you're in bad trouble. So I declared a missed approach. I declared an emergency. The radar controller said, well, climb 320 back around 2,000 feet, clear for the second approach. I was trying to explain to him I had no instruments. And you know what he said to me? He said, maybe they'll come back on. I thought, you dummy, I'm about to get killed. But you know what? Those instruments came back on in a few moments. I said, praise the Lord. And if you've been there, you've really been saying praise the Lord. And so I lined up on the outer marker and the instrument approach for the second time. And all of a sudden at that outer marker, as I dropped my landing gear, put in the three slaps, the right engine on my plane goes, whoa, and the right engine went out. Then every instrument on that plane went out. This time, the most important instrument, the attitude indicator, that you if you're flying straight level, it began to spin around and around. 
And then all of a sudden the cockpit went totally black. I'm in total darkness now. I don't know if I was upside down. I don't know if I was upside, right side up. I don't know if I was diving. I don't know if I was climbing. I was in the worst situation anybody could ever be in. Oh, I knew I was crashing. All I could say was, oh, God. Oh, God. But the greatest thing I know this morning is we have a God that's a present help in time of trouble. I said, we have a God that's a present help in time of trouble. But in moments I was crashing. They said, I cut the tops out of pine trees between a quarter to a half mile. The last hundred yards are really pine trees this large. When my plane came to a stop, the whole right side of my plane had been torn off. My feet and legs were jammed beneath the dash of the plane. My upper body laid on the ground with a pine tree this large across my chest. I lay there torn to pieces. I lay there drowning on my own blood. I lay there in more pain than words can describe. You say, Brother Fowler, what did you do? You know what I did? I did just what you do. I prayed. I prayed. But you know what I prayed? I prayed, God, I want to know that I'm ready. I want to know that I'm ready. You say, Brother Fowler, you've been preaching 20 years at that time. Yes, I've been preaching 20 years at that time. But I don't care how long you've been preaching. I don't care how long you've been teaching Sunday school. I don't care how long you've been directing a choir. I'm going to tell you, when you're about to meet God, nothing's more important than being ready to meet God. The the greatest miracle is not someone walking from a wheelchair. The greatest miracle is not blinded eyes being opened. The greatest miracle is not cancer being healed. But the greatest miracle is someone finding Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And I lay there torn to pieces. My left foot had been torn off. Part of my right foot was missing. Hunks of flesh as big as my two fists pulled from both my legs, flung back in sides, all the way to the bone. My right hip went out the back of my pants through my buttocks and, cr and crushed on the ground. All my ribs were crushed beneath that pine tree. The nerves in my spine were twisted and torn. My face was cut to pieces. My nose was actually torn off and was lying over here. You say, Brother Fowler, how bad was the crash? Let me show you a couple things this morning to give you an idea of how bad the crash really was. Just, just an idea. See these pieces of metal? That's parts of my plane. My plane was torn to pieces. It was metal like this, it shredded my body. The yoke of the plane, which some of you would call the steering wheel, the yoke of the plane was connected with a steel pipe. The impact was so great that the yoke actually broke off in my hand. That's quite an impact. That's quite an impact. The pants I was wearing. Show you something here. See this hole here in the back of my pants? That's where my hip came out. These pants shredded, cut to pieces. I lay there drowning on my own blood. I lay there drowning on my own blood. You say, Brother Fowler, well, why did that have to happen to you? Brother Fowler, you're a man of God. You're a man of God. Church, listen to me. That's why it happened. See, the devil could care less about hurting someone that's not really working for God. But you show me someone that's trying to build the kingdom of God. Someone that's preaching the gospel. Someone that's trying to win the loss at any cost. And I'll show you someone that is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But see what had happened. Just a few weeks before this plane crash, on a Sunday night, at our church in Panama City Beach, Florida, a church my wife and I had founded, Victory Tabernacle Assembly of God Church. On that Sunday night, a Satanist high priest and a Satanist high priestess came in our church, and they were stooped over, and they were growling, and they were snarling, and they were kicking, and they were biting. Oh, yeah, they were making havoc in that church. I mean, they came to destroy that service. They came to destroy this ministry. But I'm here to tell you, they did not leave like they came. I said they did not leave like they came. You know why? You know why? Because greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. Somebody here, I said greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. But see, that man, that Satanist high priest, he been a high priest for 20 years. His wife had been a high priestess for 18 years. They were throwing men and women all over that building. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me. You know what he said? He said, put them down. Put them down. You know where the devil's place is? Under our feet. I said, I, I said, under our feet. 
Oh, somebody hear that. And you know what I did? I backed off across that building. I got me a running start, and I drop kicked that man in the chest. He turned about three flips backwards, and about 15 men jumped on top of it, and we cast the devil out. He say, I look over that, that lady, and she was doing the same thing. She was just throwing men. And I had some big men in my church, and she would one-armed them across the building. She was so demon-possessed. You say, he didn't. Yeah, I did. I backed off across that building. I got me a running start. I kicked her right in the chest. She turned about three flips backwards, and about 20 women jumped on top of her. I mean, I mean, cast the devils out. They didn't leave like they came. I said, they didn't, they didn't leave like they came. Now, some of you look at me like, well, Brother Fowler, I don't believe in the Satanists. I'm going to tell you, they're very real. They're very real. I spent days counseling with this couple after, after their deliverance. And you know what they shared with me? She, they shared with me they'd even offered to throw their own children on the altar to Satan. Kill through their own kids. You know what they shared with me? That many of the kids that are missing today have been actually kidnapped by the Satanist. And they shared with me that many of these beautiful young girls that you've seen pictures of missing young girls, they've been actually kidnapped and been used as what they call breeders. Made to have sexual intercourse with Satanist high priests so they can conceive and bring forth babies. And, and then they take little darling babies and, and skin them alive. Cut them into pieces and lay that baby's body parts on the altar to Satan. And then they take that baby body parts and, and grind and blend and, and actually eat and partake of that baby's body as a part of their ritual. You know what? They're serious about serving their God. The Satanists are serious about serving. You know what God let me know? It's time that God's people get serious about serving our God. I said it's time that God's people get serious about serving our God. But see, after their deliverance, it, it caused us to number one, the Satanist movement around the world. See, this man was known as the enforcer. He traveled around the world enforcing Satanistic discipline. Country after country enforcing their discipline. Anyone want to get out of the Satanist church? Either he would discipline them in their staying or he would just flat kill them. Somebody hear that? And it caused such a war in their movement because of, that, of that, that deliverance. Just the two days or so before the crash, I received another call stating to me that I've been placed number two on the Satan church's hit list around the world. They said, we're going to kill you. Sometime, someplace, or other, we're going to kill you. I'm going to tell you something, church. This plane crash was not an accident. There's no way that many things could go wrong with one plane at one time. See, the Satanists, uh, they have such underground. They've been following my flight plans. They've been following uh, everything I was doing. And that day, they knew the weather's conducive. They knew where I was going. And they had connections in Marie, Mississippi. And while I was there in Meridian, that day, they actually sabotaged my plane. They tampered with the instruments of the plane. They tampered with the fuel system switch on the right engine, causing the right engine to fail. And the thing that proved my plane had actually been sabotaged, the avian had disconnected the emergency locating transmitter, which is a device in a plane that will send out a signal, should you have a plane crash, you can be rescued in 15, 20, 30 minutes max. They disconnected the transmitter. You know how long I spent in the wreckage of the plane? Almost 15 hours. Almost 15 hours I lay there torn to pieces. Demons all around that plane. I heard them. They were laughing. They were mocking. I heard them say, we got him. We got him. We got Charlie Fowler. We got Charlie Fowler. He won't build any more Christian schools. He won't preach any more revivals. We got Charlie Fowler. We got him. We got him. Oh, they begin to celebrate. But you know something, church? That's the mistake they made. They started celebrating too early. I said they started. I said they I said, I said they started celebrating too early. Because all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came on me. I said the Holy Ghost came on me and brought to my remembrance the word of God, the word that I read to you this morning that says I shall not die. I shall not, I said I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. As I quoted that scripture, those demons had to back off. They had to, I said they had, they had to back, they could not take me. And then God did something so beautiful. He began to work a series of miracles as I lay in that wreckage. I lay there and I was praying for my family. I knew my family had to be in torment because I was at home and I was supposed to be home. I knew they had to do something that happened. But see, in those days, we didn't have mobile phones. Thank God for mobile phones today. But back then, we had what we called pagers, or I called mine a beeper, voice activated beeper. And uh, all of a sudden, as I lay there in the wreckage, praying for my family, that beeper goes beep, 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 beep. And I heard my son say, Daddy, please call home. Daddy, please call home. See, a newsflash had come across the television that a plane had crashed. 
And my wife knew immediately then in the spirit it was me. She said, that's your daddy. My son said, no, mama, that's not daddy. Daddy just got busy. I'll call him. He'll call us right back. But see, just hearing my son's voice gave me a spark. Just hearing his voice gave me a spark. Oh, but see, that page had been thrown about 15 feet from me, so I couldn't reach it to push a button. So the miracle is I, I could not push it or receive a, another a message. But after hours had passed, after my family had been notified that I'd been lost in the wreckage of a plane somewhere, all of a sudden that page goes off again. Beep, 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 beep. And I heard my wife and my son and my daughter on the phone, the extension phones, saying, Daddy, we love you. Daddy, we're praying for you. Daddy, we love you. Daddy, we're praying for you. And I'm going to tell you something. All the devils in hell couldn't have killed me then. I said, all the, de I said, all the devils in hell couldn't have killed me then. And then God did something so wonderful. He began to give me a series of flashbacks. Everybody say flashbacks. Come on, say flashback. You know what we need here this morning? We need some flashbacks. I said, we need some flashbacks. We need to see where we once were and where we are right now. Somebody hear this. The first flashback the Lord gave me was when I was six years old. I got saved. Six years old, I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, my God. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know God saves drug addicts and alcoholics and, and uh, whoremongers and uh, murderers. And, and I thank God he does that. But you know what the greatest miracle is? Get saved when you're young. I'm grateful to tell you that I've never held a cigarette between my fingers. I never popped the top on a can of beer in my life. I'm grateful to tell you that my wife and I were both virgins when, when she walked down that aisle. He said, Brother Father, what do you say? I'm trying to tell you something. Oh, praise God. God can save you when you're young and say, oh, save a whole lot of mess in your life. But then God gave me the flashback how all the way through school I was a Christian. You know what I tell young people everywhere I go? I said, hey, you know, you can serve God. Everywhere, everywhere, I, everywhere I went, I carried the Bible. And in high school, I wore out three Bibles when I was in high school. Three Bibles. Oh, a lot of days at lunch, I'd be fasting lunch. I'd be sitting out on an old pine tree, and I'd be reading God's Word and fasting and praying. And somebody said, well, I bet those football players thought you were kind of sissy. No. I want to tell you, those football players would come up to me, and they'd say, Charlie, would you pray for my mama? My mama's got cancer. Charlie, would you pray for my daddy? My daddy's a drunk. I had the principal of our school call me to the office just every few weeks just to pray with him. Do you hear what I'm talking about? He said, well, you can't be popular and be a Christian. I'm going to tell you young people something. Listen, and you tell your kids this for me. I want you to know something. Oh, you can be popular and serve God. I don't say this bragging, but it was not one young man more popular in Bay County, Florida than Charlie Fowler. My picture is still in the Hall of Fame there to this day. I was student body president my senior year, 3,000 kids. Are you hear what I'm talking about? You say, how why you say, I'm trying to tell you something. See, God wants to bless young people, and if they'll serve him, he can bless them. He can make them popular. He can do great and mighty things through them. I lay in the wreckage of the plane. God gave me a flashback of when I was in high school. I had this desire. I wanted to go to, to West Point. And I'm going to tell you, I worked hard to go to West Point. I mean, you got to be tops to go to West Point. I mean, I worked hard. I studied hard. And one day I got a letter. Dear Mr. Fowler, very pleased to announce that you have received an appointment at the United States Military Academy, West Point. I was so excited. Our papers came out. Our own Charlie Fowler receives an appointment to West Point. I mean, everybody excited. But you know what? One night, just a few weeks before I was going to leave for West Point, I was kneeling by my bed having a devotion. I got up, I lay on the bed, and all of a sudden I said, God, I don't know if that's what you want. And I found myself saying, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. I said, God, if you want me to, God, you want me to be a mechanic, I'll be a mechanic. You want me to be a carpenter, I'll be a carpenter. Lord, a truck driver, Lord, a teacher, Lord, a doctor. Lord, then I said, Lord, if you want me to be a preacher, and I said the word preacher, he said, that's it. And that, and God called me to preach that night, and that was 41 years ago, just Saturday. Somebody hear this. 41, my God. I preached my first message 41 years ago. Oh, somebody hear this. I canceled the appointment, went away to Bible college, came here to Lakeland, Florida to go to Southeastern Bible College. And I was honestly preaching revivals just about every night. I preached more than any student ever in the history of Southeastern Bible College. I preached every night while I was in college. I'm just, every night I was preaching somewhere just about. And then God gave me the flashback of my most successful revival. That's when I went to Fort Myers, Florida and found Sister Fowler. <laughs> I've never seen anything that pretty in all my life. Are you hear what I'm talking about? And this week we'll be, we'll be married 38 years. Somebody say praise God about that. This week. <laughs> and then God gave me the flashback. I wanted us to go to Oral Roberts University. You know what I told God? 
God, I don't want to go. God, I don't know anybody in Oklahoma. God, I, I'm preaching just about every night here in Florida. God, I don't know anybody in Oklahoma. And God said, go. So I'm going to tell you something. We took off to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'd get to Oral Roberts University, and oh, it was so wonderful. The classes were great. Oral Roberts preached chapel and everything wonderful. Oh, it was just wonderful. All of a sudden, Sunday came. And God gave me the flashback of this. You know what Sunday means? Sunday means church. And so, you know, I looked at my other wife. I said, you know, baby, I'm licensed with the Assemblies of God, so we'll just find us one of these Assemblies of God churches and introduce ourselves to the pastor. He's bound to let us preach. So we got the yellow pages down, found us an Assemblies of God church, and we get to that church that morning, and I introduced myself. I'm Evangelist Charlie Fowler. This is my wife, Susie. We're from Florida. He looked at me like, well, big deal. <laughs> he didn't say, we're glad to have you make yourself at home. It was like, big deal. I mean, we went to other church that night, same thing, big deal. A whole month went by. Everywhere we went, it's like, big deal. Nobody has to sing. Nobody has to testify. They didn't even ask me to toot my horn. And if you don't toot your own horn, ain't nobody going to toot it for you. But it was, it was terrible. And to make matters worse, my wife was a daddy's girl. And I'd taken her 1,500 miles away from her daddy. I'd come home from school. She'd be bawling and squalling and crying. And, and I said, baby, baby, don't cry. Baby, please don't cry. And I'd start crying because we could get her to quit crying. I didn't know wives cried. I never had a wife before. <laughs> but see, the point I want you to get is the devil thought he had to stop. How many know the devil wants to stop you? I said, I mean, you know, the devil wants to stop you. You know what I thought as I was coming today? The devil has been wanting to stop this outpouring here in Lakeland. But I'm going to tell you, you know what God let me know? There's no stopping God. So there's no stopping us. There's no stopping God. There's no stopping this outpouring. My God, I said, there's no, there's no stopping this outpouring. No stopping this outpouring. And then God gave me the flashback. Hear this now. One Sunday morning, we started to this church we'd heard about. And we drove, and we drove, and we drove. We never did find the church. It got to be 11 o'clock, 11.15, almost 11.30. We ain't even found the church yet. I look at my wife and said, baby, we better stop in this church we come to. We're going to miss church. And all of a sudden, we get the road a little ways. A little sign by the road said, Assembly of God. So I said, baby, that's what we are. We just go there. We turn down this little street, get this little Assembly of God church. I can hear this having church in that church. I mean, open the car door for my wife, and we get to the door of the church, and we go for her, and boy, we walk in, my wife turns blue, she turns pink, she turns red, she turns purple, because we done walked in an all-black church. Oh, 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 black church. But they was having church. I mean, they was having church. They had a fella on a hammond organ. He was sliding from one side to the other. Uh, they had a fella playing the grand piano. He just bouncing all over that stool. Uh, they had a drummer. My God, I wish you could have seen that drummer. He was so excited. He was beating on the wall, beating on the floor, banging on the cymbals. I mean, there were people dancing and shouting, running the aisles, talking in tongues. My wife's standing there changing colors. I said, baby, I'm going to go get my horn. And I ran out there and got that old saxophone, and I ran back in that church, and I teach those black folks one step, they teach me two. <laughs> you talk about church, we had church. I mean, we had church. Along about 2.30 that afternoon, 2.30, they turned their service to the preacher. When black folks have church, they have church. Most of us white folks are afraid somebody going to beat us to the steakhouse. <laughs> black folks, they don't care. They just have church. So my wife and I was the only white folks there, so we kind of sit off to the side. And By the time the biggest black dude I've ever seen started preaching. He was big and he was black. All of a sudden, he got in there pretty close to me. He stopped. He says, come in. I didn't want to get him to go there get up and run. But I got up and went to him. He raised one hand like this, reached out with the other hand and laid it on my head. And he said, I can see that you've been discouraged. I can see that you felt alone. But God's have you know this day that he ain't forgotten you. He ain't forgotten. Oh, he ain't forgotten. Now, you may not believe this, but I lay in the wreckage of that plane torn to pieces, all my blood leaving my body. All of a sudden, I heard someone coming through those woods. And the next thing I knew, 
it was that same big old black preacher. That same big old black preacher. You say, my God, Brother Fowler, how did he get there? All I can tell you is God picked him up in Tulsa and translated into that swamp in Panama City. But I'm going to tell you something. He reached out in that wreckage of that plane and touched me. And the only thing he said is he ain't forgotten you. He ain't forgotten you. And the greatest thing I know this morning in my life is that God ain't forgotten me. He ain't forgotten you. He knows right where you are right now. You're not here by chance. You're not here by accident. Oh, but God knows you're here by divine appointment. I said, you are here. You are here. By the power of God, 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 ain't forgotten you. He ain't forgotten you. And God gave me the flashback how that black preacher, that son in that church, even prophesied that God was going to open doors for our ministry. And you know something? That very night I was at another church. The pastor started crying. He said, Brother Fowler, I've never done this before in my life, but God said, let you preach and let you preach tonight. Somebody hear this. And you know something? That night I preached my first time in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Revival broke out. Revival went the next few weeks. Or you hear what I'm talking about? And the last night of the revival, there was 15 pastors there, and each one of those pastors invited us to come to their church revival. The first year in Oklahoma, we looked like I wasn't going to get to preach a time. I ended up preaching 321 times. Somebody hear this. The next year, 330-something times. My senior year in college, 346 times. And from then until I had the bad plane crash, over 400 services every year. If you take all the times I preached and divide by 41, there's over 300 times a year I've preached the last 41 years. Somebody hear what I'm talking about. My you know why? The Lord can do it again. I said, the Lord can do it again. Oh, I was lying there in that wreckage of the plane, and, and God gave me the flashback of our first plane crash. Yes, I've had two crashes. Now, if you buy that DVD that I shared with you this morning, if you get that DVD, the news people made a mistake. They said, I've had three crashes. I've only had two. Two's enough. Two's enough. But God gave me the flashback of the first plane crash. In 1980, my wife and my mother-in-law and my two children and I Cocker Spangler took off from an airport in a single-engine plane in the singles Missouri area. And as we was climbing out, the engine on the plane exploded. And there was nowhere to go. Trees and houses and wires everywhere. And so I crashed. When the plane came to a stop, I, I had to kick the door open. And when I kicked the door open, there was a hoarse whisper came from my throat. A hoarse whisper came from my throat. And the words were, devil, you didn't win. Devil, you didn't win. See, listen to me. Listen to me. Nationwide newspapers picked up that slogan. Even in USA Today News, front page, the words were evangelist and family crashes. But evangelist says, devil, you didn't win. Devil, you didn't win. And I'm here to tell you today, the devil didn't win. He never has won, and he never will win. Oh, my God. Now, my wife's back was broken in that plane crash. My children were bruised and scratched. My mother-in-law had broken ribs and a punctured lung. But I'd received the worst of the injuries. My seat had broken. And I'd fallen into the yoke of the plane, hitting it with my throat, and actually had crushed my voice box. Crushed it. Crushed it. Days later, I woke up in intensive care. Hoses and wires connected all parts of my body. And you listen to me. The doctors came in and they said, Reverend Fowler, we're so sorry to have to tell you this, but you will never speak again. You will never utter another sound. Your voice box has been destroyed like you'd take an egg and throw it on the pavement. They were saying the ministry was over. They said I would have to breathe through a steel pipe called a trach the rest of my life. They said I would have to write messages to communicate, or I'd have to learn sign language. Can you imagine me trying to preach it? You go like this today. <laughs> but you hear this. Months passed. Months passed. Could not utter a sound. I was having to breathe through a steel pipe called a trach. And God gave me the flashback of this. Hear this now. It came time for a major checkup back in St. Louis, Missouri. My wife. My mother, my two children, we went back to St. Louis, Missouri for this checkup, which is going to be on Monday. But the Sunday before that Monday, the Webster Grove Church of God 
was having a benefit sing for our ministry. Trying to raise money to try to keep the school open the rest of the year. Because I couldn't preach anymore. They were just trying to keep the school open the rest of that year. I walked in that service that night carrying my pad so I could write messages. Breathing through the steel pipe. God had worked a miracle for my wife. He had healed her back by this time. That night, our choir from our school in Arkansas was there singing. The principal of our school, Bill Allen Carter, was there preaching. And that night, during the altar call, I remember standing on the platform with Brother Cartwright and Brother Bevan Joe Smith. And I saw the kids from our school around the altars and the kids in the church and many, many people. My wife was singing. And I wanted it so bad just to get down there and put my arms around those kids and say, I love you. I love you. But I couldn't speak. You know, we take for granted saying the words, good morning. We take for granted saying, isn't God good? We take for granted saying, Jesus loves you. And I couldn't utter a sound. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me. Now, some of you may not believe God talks, but he talks. You know what God said to me? He said, pick up the microphone. I heard him. I heard him. He said, pick up the microphone. And I reached out, picked up the microphone, and put that finger with that steel pipe. And it went something about like this. This old house that I have been living in is needing repairs. The windows and the shutters let me in cold, cold air. And I say to myself, I got to fix them when I can get the time. But all I've been getting lately is leaving on my mind. Would you sing it? Seems like lately I've got leaving on my mind. It's on my mind. It seems that's all I've been thinking about almost all the time. I know that soon and very, very soon now I'm going to be leaving my troubles behind because lately I've got leaving, leaving all. When I finished singing the song, people were screaming and clapping and people running the aisles. And I thought the pastor was going to tear the platform down. I mean, I'd received the greatest healing I'd ever received. And I couldn't wait till the next morning to get that doctor's office. I mean, I ran that doctor's office before he even called my name. I threw that finger on the my heart. Hello, doctor. <laughs> Hello, doctor. <laughs> Hello. He liked to pass out. <laughs> to this day, that doctor can't believe it. That's been a few million miles ago. That's been several thousand services ago. And you know what God said to me when I lay in the wreckage of the plane? He said, you think I brought you through all that to let you die now? Look at me, church. Do you think God's done all he's done for you to let you die now? You think he's done everything he's done for you to let you down now? Oh, listen to me. I wish I had time to share all the flashbacks. I don't, but I got to tell you this. Finally, the storm began to break, and daylight began to come. And oh, all of a sudden, I heard someone running through the woods, running through the woods. And my heart began to go, poop, 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 poop. And I heard a helicopter distance. And I went to go, tch, 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 tch. I mean, I was getting so excited. But all of a sudden, a deputy sheriff, a deputy sheriff broke down that area where I'd crashed. I reached behind that pine tree like this and waved to him. Scared him so bad. He grabbed his walkie talkie on He's alive. He's alive. And I was alive. I was alive. I was alive. You know. And he, he, he ran up to me. He said, Reverend Fowler, Reverend Fowler, Reverend Fowler, Reverend Fowler. Be real still. Be real still. Be real still. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Lots of steps on the way. Lots of steps on the way. Lots of steps on the way. And he took off and left me. <laughs> oh, where's he going? Where's he going? But come to find out he was going back to his vehicle to get a fire extinguisher because I had laid there and 
gasoline all night long. I was saturated in gas. I hear this. This deputy sheriff is not even saved, but he tells this story. It's so true, I know I was there. He tells the story how all night long, he and hundreds of others have been looking for me. Hundreds. He said, no matter where he went that night in those woods and next to that swamp, he said, no matter where he went, he'd come to a certain spot, and he just felt weird. He used the word weird, weird. He said, I could sense you were somewhere close, but I didn't know where you were. But he said, the next morning he was there, that same spot, just feeling weird. He said, all of a sudden they radioed him. They thought they'd found part of my plane near the bay, about eight miles away, and they wanted him to get there immediately. And he said he cranked and he cranked on his four-wheel drive vehicle. It wouldn't start. It just wouldn't start. He said, so he turned and looked behind him, and there was a pickup truck and what appeared to be a hunter, a hunter in that pickup truck. So he said, I'll get that hunter to help me start my vehicle. So he goes back there to the hunter. The hunter's lying back in the seat like this with his arms crossed. His eyes were closed. And all night long, church, I lay in the wreckage of that plane. My eyes closed much of the night, not because I was asleep or unconscious, but because of all the debris and the fumes. My arms crossed around the old pine tree like this. He said, all of a sudden, the hunter set up and said, what are you doing? The deputy sheriff says, we're trying to find Reverend Fowler. He had a plane crash last night. The hunter pointed and said, he's between here and the creek. Pointed right to where I was. Somebody hear this. Right to where I was. The deputy sheriff, now hear this. Oh, ha, glory to God. He was, that's how I found him. He went where the, the hunter had pointed. When he got back to his vehicle, his vehicle carted right up, and he made a trail almost back to where I was. But by this time, the helicopter landed. The rescue team was there. But you were standing right in my head. The hunter. The hunter. Matter of fact, the hunter had been with me all night. All night. I hear this. this. This deputy sheriff, and he, when he got there, all this rescue team was there, and they were trying to get the, the pine tree off of me. 15, 20, 25 men couldn't budge the tree. Could not budge the tree. They'd go one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, uh. They couldn't budge it. The hunter never touched the tree, but he took three steps back. He said, my God, my God, my God. The third time he said, my God, the pine tree goes right off of me. Those men couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. They pulled me from the wreckage of the plane. One of the number one flight surgeons in the world was there from Tyndall Air Force Base. Could not even find a vein to put a needle in. All my veins had collapsed. Even my groin vein had collapsed. Now, if you get that, bit, that DVD, you'll see a needle in my hand, but not in a vein. All my veins had collapsed. Now, here, the deputy sheriff was standing there and all these other sheriffs and all these other rescue team, the county, the county sheriff there, and this doctor said, he will never make it to the hospital. Opened my eyes and said, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. I shall not die. Oh, somebody hear it. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. They then rushed me to the helicopter, then rushed me to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, not one nurse wanted to touch me. Not one doctor wanted to touch me. They'd never seen anybody so torn to pieces, so shredded as I was. They told my wife, they said, there's no reason to put his foot back on. There's no reason to put his hip back in his body. There's no reason he's not going to live throughout the rest of the day and the night. And my wife, thank God for my wife. Matter of fact, her first name is Faith. Faith Suzanne Fowler. Thank God for a wife of faith. You know what she said to that doctor? She said, doctors, God has promised my husband and I many things. And many of his promises he hath fulfilled. And many he has not. So she said, doctors, that means God's not through with my husband. She said, you just do your best and the Lord will do the rest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I spent the rest of that day and all that night in surgery. Now, while I was in surgery that night, the deputy sheriff began to feel weird again. He goes back to the crash site with a flashlight. He wanted to find my Bible. He knew I had a Bible. He was looking all around the crash site, and all of a sudden he heard some footsteps. He turned and looked, and there was that hunter. And the hunter says, what are you doing? The sheriff says, I'm trying to find Reverend Fowler's Bible. The hunter pointed at the sheriff said, don't worry about Reverend Fowler's Bible. It's right where he would have been killed. 
When he said the word kill, just like that, the hunter vanished. Vanished. To this day, they've never found my Bible. You know why? That's where I'd have been killed. But hear this. That every sheriff fell on his face right there in the woods and gave his heart to the Lord. He knew he'd either seen an angel or he had seen the Lord. He then rushes back to his vehicle where his partner was. He said, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where? He said, and the partner said, nobody's been here, just you and me. They then rushed to the hospital. They wanted to tell my wife about the hunter, the hunter. When they got to the hospital, though, my wife was surrounded by so many church friends and pastor friends and family members that he couldn't speak to my wife. But his own mother, please hear this, his own biological mother was in that hospital. She'd had a stroke that week. She was paralyzed half of her body and could not utter a sound. The deputy sheriff ran down the hall to his mother's room and began to tell her the story of the hunter. When she heard the story of the hunter, she immediately set up and began to speak. Healed by the power of God. <laughs> I said, he, I said, healed by the power of God. The next day, she walked out of that hospital. She's been to our church several times in Panama City just telling people, just by hearing the story of the hunter, she was healed. Now hear this. Hear this. The doctor said he didn't give any hope that I would live. No hope that I would live. Days passed. Days passed. Days passed. And one morning I started coming to. And by this time my wife had heard the story of the hunter. And the first thing she said to me, she says, baby, baby, do you remember anything about a hunter? And I said, a hunter? I said, yeah, baby. He came all the way from Pensacola with me. See, it was like when I prayed that last prayer in Pensacola that the Lord came down and got in that plane in the form of a hunter. He said, Brother Fowler, why would the Lord come down in the form of a hunter? I can't tell you the fact he knew I'd be lost that night in the wreckage of a plane torn to pieces where there are alligators and snakes and wild hogs and all of the kind of animals out there in that swamp. Uh, somebody hear this. Uh, I said, yeah, baby. He came all the way from Pensacola with me. And I stopped. She said, baby, baby, what happened? I said, baby, that hunter took me to a crystal sea. And I said, on the other side of that sea was thousands and thousands of people. And she said, did you know any of them? And I named a couple of names. And I stopped. She said, baby, 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 what happened? I said, baby, all of a sudden a serpent raised his head up right out of the dry ground. A serpent. I said, baby, that hunter ran over there and stomped his head back in the ground. And then I said, baby, that serpent was Satan trying to kill me. But that hunter was the Lord keeping him from killing me. <laughs> now listen to me. Our, our first grandson, come here, hunter. Our first grandson is named Hunter. You know why? Because his dad and his mom were so thankful to God for sparing me, they named our first grandson Hunter. After that angel of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But anyway, you know, I, the next many weeks, the doctor said, well, yeah, maybe Reverend Fowler's going to live now. Do you know what they said? They said, but he'll never stand. He'll never take a step. Never. They said it would be two and a half to three years before I could sit up. I sat up in five weeks. In seven weeks, I begged those doctors, please just let me go home. I just wanted to go home. I hated being in the hospital. I knew my wife and children and friends and family would take care of me. I just wanted to go home. And the day I got to go home, kids lined the streets waving handkerchiefs. Welcome home, Brother Fowler. Welcome home. Marquees and billboards around the town, around the county say, welcome home, Brother Fowler. Welcome home. Welcome home. But when I got to the house that day, the news media was there, the television stations, the newspapers. And the next day, front page, Reverend Fowler comes home. But doctors say he will never stand, will never walk. I'm going to tell you something, church. I can't, I can't explain to you the depression that set in the next several weeks. As I lay in that hospital bed there in my home, now I was a cripple. Preachers came to my house, brother. And they said, Brother Fowler, I'm so sorry. You're never going to walk again. And one preacher came to my house one day, and brother, this honest God's truth, he looked at me and he said, Brother Fowler, I hate to tell you this, but God told me to tell you. God told me to tell you, you're never going to walk. I looked at him and I said, 
you don't know the God I know. But I want you to hear this now. When that man left my house that day, I started crying. The devil began to talk to me. You know the devil knows how to talk? The devil's been talking to some of you. The devil began to talk to me. You know what he said? He said, you know, that's a man of God. He's telling you the truth. You're never going to walk. You're never going to stand. All the tests prove you're never going to stand. You're never going to walk. All the doctors say that, so you're never going to walk. And I lay there, and I was crying so hard for hours. I couldn't stop crying. My little daughter came in from school, and she came in, and right behind her, our son came in. And I couldn't even speak to my kids. I was crying so hard. And my daughter put a tape on the tape deck, and she started singing. And our son Joshua, he joined in with her. You know what they were singing to me? The song that says, Fear Not. My child, I'm with you always. Fear not, my child, I'm with you always. And all of a sudden, brother, I got a spark. I mean, I got a spark. I told my kids, I said, you go to the church and you tell the secretaries to start calling people and tell them as soon as I can get back to church, I'm going to start a series of messages on faith, on faith, on faith. Can you imagine a cripple trying to teach faith? The day I was going to start the series of messages on faith, that day I was back at the doctor. The doctor was very stern with me that day and very harsh. He looked at me, I never forget. He said, Reverend, face it. You are never going to stand. You are never going to walk. Face it. I left his office crying. I left his office in that wheelchair crying. And that night when I went to church in that wheelchair, I was so depressed. I was so discouraged. I said before my congregation, I thought, God, God, how can I do this? God, how can I preach to these people, God, that you're God? How can I tell them, God, you can do anything when they see me, Lord, sitting in a wheelchair? God, I, how, how can I do it? And all of a sudden, I read my text. You know what my text was that night? Now, faith. Everybody say, now, faith. Come on, say, now, faith. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me and said, Charlie Fowler, if it's not now, it's not faith. If it's not now, it's not faith. And then all of a sudden, hit me like a ton of bricks. By his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we were healed. Oh, hallelujah. All of a sudden, I realized something. If we are healed and we're healed, then I am healed. If we were healed, I am, then I am healed. I looked at my people and I said, all oh, you believe I'm going to walk tonight, stand if he begin to praise the Lord. All of a sudden, I saw this one stand. Then I saw that one stand. Then I saw those stand. Then I saw these stand. And all of a sudden, all of the church people were standing, hands raised toward heaven. The next thing I knew, I said, by his stripes. If you're healed, by his stripes, we're healed. If you're healed, we're healed. Then I'm healed. And I jumped from the wheelchair and took off down that aisle. Healed by the power. Healed by the power. Healed, 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 healed by the power of God. And I'm still healed. I'm still healed. I'm still healed. I'm still healed. I'm still healed.